Hey, everybody. I wanted to give you a quick um, kind of tutorial, I guess, before we get into the interview with Dr. Castro. We're going to be talking about a concept called idealism, which is a philosophy that might be new to you. And we get into it pretty deeply in this conversation. So I wanted to lay some groundwork so you get the most out of it. I can tell you this idea of idealism has really changed my life, my worldview, the way I view myself, the way I view the world around me. So I really want you guys to get the most you can out of this interview. And I do encourage you to get the book, uh, Why Materialism is Baloney by Dr. Kashup, if this interests you at all. I'm going to do a screen share for those watching on YouTube. For those that are uh, listening on my podcast, you should be able to follow this without the screen share, but the screen share helps a little bit. So let me go ahead and start this up. So there are basically two ways we can view what we see around us, uh, everything around us, and the things we can't see. One is materialism, which is the idea that all there is is what we can see, what we can measure, what we can feel. Um, this is the predominant view in society today. What it says is that, that material exists at first. At some point when life got complex enough, consciousness, which we can't really define and don't know how, but once life got complex enough, consciousness arose. And consciousness is the idea that we can experience things, that we experience ourselves that we can think, that we know what's going on. So that arose from the, the material. So a logical conclusion of that is that when the body dies, if the body, if consciousness arises from the body, then consciousness dies. So those are the logical conclusions of materialism and kind of what it's all about. Idealism is the opposite of that. Idealism believes that consciousness is the foundation of everything. Idealism is, um, since this consciousness predates, to use a term that's found in time, predates the material, even though it doesn't make sense because time is actually created, uh, time and space were created by our, our, our perception of where we are. We'll get into that later on. Uh, but the material is derivative. Everything we see, fence, and sense around us actually exists in mind. It's not, uh, mind does not come from it. Uh, consciousness never began for this reason. It exists outside of time. And since it never began and exists out of time, consciousness never ends. So this is an ancient idea. This goes back in all of our creation myths, uh, whether it's Christian or Hindu or any other indigenous tribe or whatever, whether this consciousness dreamed up this world or spoke it into existence in the case of Genesis or spit on something or whatever, somehow consciousness created the material world. This is an idea that we've had as human beings for a very, very long time that we've actually forgotten. So I want to tell you a real quick creation story to kind of solidify this. So in the beginning, there was uh, what we would call mind, or we might call God, or we might call self with a capital S. We might call it consciousness, or as the Hindus call it, we might call it Brahman. This is something that, again, this is not the universe. This is outside of the universe. This is what created the universe. So there's consciousness and something excites this consciousness. Something, something happens, there's potential in this consciousness. It doesn't, we can't perceive it, but uh, as, as where we are now, but something it differentiates and it creates a bubble or a ripple or whatever you want to call it, but it creates a self-identifying entity that's us, that has an ego, that has sensory perceptions. So once we come into this, this feeling, this a feeling of being separate, something happens and we go through an illusion that the Hindus call Maya. And we kind of form a bubble around ourselves. And this illusion is that we are separate and that we exist independently and everything outside of us is different when the truth is uh, that we're actually part of consciousness. So now we perceive this outside world that has other people in it, that has objects in it, and has events that happen around us that we perceive that we can't control. And that's where we are right now as we live our lives. But really inside of us, there's still this, what we might call souls. If we're a Christian, we might call it the capital I, or we might, or the Hindus call it Atman. Or, so this Atman is the same as Brahman, which is what the Hindus call consciousness. And that's why in the diagram I'm showing, on the inside I show it's the same as the outside. So this is the concept that uh, we're going to discuss with Dr. Kashup in depth today. I hope this real quick overview gives you an idea. So to review, we're all part of consciousness. We're all part of mind. Um, we, we form this thing that we perceive as being separate, that we call ourselves, that's made up of our ego and our sense perception. But we always continue to have this, this observer, this Atman, this soul, 
that's inside of us. But for a time, we live in this illusion where we think we're separate from everything else. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start the interview. Close your eyes and imagine. What if the things in life that cause us the greatest pain, the things that bring us grief, are challenges? Challenges designed to help us grow, to ultimately become what we were always meant to be. We feel like we've been buried, but what if, like a seed, we've been planted? And having been planted, we grow to become a mighty tree. Now, open your eyes. Open your eyes to this way of viewing life. Come with me as we explore your true, infinite, eternal nature. This is Grief to Growth, and I am your host, Brian Smith. Hey everybody, it's Brian. I'm back with another episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me one of my heroes, Dr. Bernardo Kastrup. I have to admit, I'm a little bit nervous about interviewing Dr. Kastrup because I've been reading his books and watching him on YouTube for quite a while and I finally got him here with me. I wanted to introduce you guys to an idea called idealism. And we'll get into that, what that is in a minute. But I want to first start with a quote by Dr. Kastrup. He says, let there be no ambiguity here. It is a direct and unavoidable implication of my worldview that your consciousness, your subjective experience at being here right now will survive your bodily death. So I wanna read his bio and then we'll get started. Uh, Dr. Castle's work has been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism, the notion that reality is essentially mental. He is a PhD in philosophy, ontology, philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer engineering, reconfigurable computing, artificial intelligence. As a scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, otherwise known as CERN, and the Phelps Research Laboratories, where the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. Formulated in detail in many academic papers and books, his ideas have been featured on Scientific American, the Institute of Art and Ideas, the blog of the American Philosophical Association, and Big Think, among others. His most recent book is The Idea of the World, a Multidisciplinary Argument for the Mental Nature of Reality. For more information and for freely downloadable papers, videos, etc., please visit his website, bernardocastrop.com. That's Bernardo, B-E-R-N-A-R-D-O, Castrop, K-A-S-T-R-U-P.com. And with that, I want to welcome Dr. Castrop to Grief to Growth. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's a pleasure. I, I have to tell you right up front, um, as I said, I, I'm, I'm nervous about interviewing you. I've been following your work for a while, but I will tell you, I don't know a lot about philosophy. I had never read, I don't think I'd ever read a philosophy book until I, I read your book, uh, Why Materi Materialism is Baloney. And frankly, I would look at philosophers and say, they just tie themselves up in knots. You know, there's a guy that says, I think, therefore I am. And I'm like, well, I know that I am. I don't need philosophy for that. And I hear Daniel Dennett say, think, come to the conclusion that consciousness is, is, a, is a fallacy. It's just an a, a, a artificial construct. So when I read your books, it really, they really grabbed me, you know, this idea of uh, material or, of, of idealism. So could you explain to me what is idealism? Idealism is a metaphysics, like materialism is. It's a hypothesis or a statement about the nature of reality, about what reality essentially is, uh, which is to say more than to say how reality behaves. Mm -hmm. The latter is what science does. Science studies the behavior of nature. If you do this and that, how will nature reply by manifesting a certain behavior? That, that's what an experiment is. Uh, philosophy goes a step further. Once we know how nature behaves, what inferences, what best guesses can we make about what nature essentially is? Um, today, we hardly give it a second thought because the, the idea of metaphysical materialism, the notion that reality is essentially material, in, order, in, in other words, something outside and independent of consciousness, is so ingrained in the culture that we take it for granted. And very, people, very few people know how precarious uh, this idea is, how malformed and untenable uh, it is. So there, there, there is an open playing field, and I think idealism is, is the best hypothesis for what reality is. It basically says that reality is mental. It's not in your mind alone. It's not in my mind alone. It is out there beyond our personal minds, but it is mental at a transpersonal level. Yeah, and I think that's uh, it's, it's interesting also because this idea I was when I was reading your bio this morning, uh, it says you're leading the modern renaissance of idealism. And I think some people times we think materialism has always been the paradigm. We've always thought that everything is just material, and that's not true, is it? 
No, that's not true at all. No, for most of human history, that was not the paradigm. Arguably, not even the Greek atomists who are credited with having created materialism, arguably even they were not metaphysical materialists. Uh, materialism has become a mainstream a metaphysical view only from, say, the latter parts of the 19th century onwards. So it's a phenomenon of the last 150 years. Uh, some started thinking about it more seriously back in the 17th century, but it wasn't mainstream for a long time. Uh, so it's for the past century and a half that it's been uh, mainstream. So you have uh, PhDs in both uh, computer science and philosophy. Which one came first? Computer science came uh, 19 years first, the earlier. Okay. And then what got, your idea, what got you interested in philosophy? I, you know, by, by temperament, uh, I was always a philosopher. Since I was a kid, I always liked to think about the big questions, you know, mm -hmm. what is life? Who are we? What are we doing here? Where are we going to go? What is this all about? What's the point of it all? Um, I did computer engineering first because it was also a passion like philosophy, but it was a passion that gave me a better chance of uh, uh, securing some financial stability uh, in yeah. my life. Um, so that was my first uh, uh, PhD. Um, and uh, philosophy, I, I started writing books and doing philosophy for, mm -hmm. for many years. I do it for several years now uh, as a sort of a my second life. I used to be in the corporate world until, until very recently. Now I'm a full-time philosopher. Mm. Um, and I did philosophy as a, the, the extra in my life. Um, and at some point I realized that I had published so many academic papers, so, many so much technical material that I could just put it together and get uh, two PhDs in philosophy. So I got one. <laughs> yeah. So um... Was there a shift for you when you when you decided to discover that idealism was was the way to go rather than materialism? Yeah, that was a big thing because um, I think like most of us, when I was in academia studying, doing research, um, I was a materialist by default, an, an unthinking materialist. Mm -hmm. I was materialist because everybody around me was a materialist and I didn't give it a, a second thought. I was busy with other things of a scientific nature. In other words, I was busy investigating how nature behaves. Um, but at some point, uh, I was doing some research on artificial intelligence, and then you know, it's very easy to go from artificial intelligence to artificial consciousness in your own mind, mm -hmm. because you build a computer that behaves intelligently, and you start wondering, well, what would it take now to make it conscious, not only intelligent, but to have its data processing be accompanied by experience, just like the data processing in my brain is accompanied by experience. And I started posing these questions to myself and tying myself up in knots because it, it just doesn't compute this idea of creating consciousness out of something non-conscious. It's an, it's an impossible bridge to make. And then I read a paper by philosopher David Chalmers years ago, uh, in which he articulated the key problem that I was struggling with, which today is called uh, the hard problem of consciousness, mm -hmm. which basically states that there is nothing about material arrangement in terms of which we could deduce the qualities of experience. There is nothing about the position and momentum of the atoms in my brain in terms of which I could deduce what it is like for me to have a bellyache, to fall in love or, or, or taste a strawberry. Uh, it's a, an arbitrary bridge. And then I woke up to the idea that I was making a wrong but implicit assumption. I was assuming that consciousness is the derivative phenomenon and matter is the primary one. So you start from matter and you get consciousness. But I never examined that assumption. Once I started examining it, then it was very quickly arrived at the conclusion and it was a, a wrong assumption. It was a wrong um, st logical step uh, to take. And it created all the problems that uh, subsequently became obvious. So I reversed that. And, um, and I realized that it makes a lot more sense, more sense to think of mind as the primary. And everything that is created is created within mind, by mind. Not my personal mind alone, but mind as a substrate, mind as a framework, as a, as a scaffolding, the essence of reality. And therefore, you don't need to create consciousness. You can modify consciousness by you know, interfering with the brain and doing all that. You can change the configuration of consciousness. You can change the patterns of excitation of consciousness. But all reality unfolds as 
patterns of excitation of a transpersonal form of consciousness. And everything started falling in place. And uh, since then, I'm trying to communicate uh, that. And I'm not trying to convince people, but I'm, I'm inviting people to have a second look at this uh, knee-jerk assumption that we make in our culture that matter comes first and consciousness next. Invite people to consider the possibility that it may be the other way around and that all empirical observations can actually be understood as uh, supporting this, this, this stance that, uh, that uh, mind is first. Yeah, it's a big shift, I guess, because I think a lot of times when people think of, and we can interchange terms, mind, consciousness, yeah. uh, we think, well, okay, where did consciousness come from? I have my consciousness, and, and all we know is our own consciousness. All we can know is our own personal experiences. That's all, that's all we, how we know what's going on around us. So I think we assume, well, there must have been some matter first, and then the matter became conscious, and people don't even realize that that's an assumption in itself. And this consciousness you're talking about is not a personal consciousness like my consciousness but it's a it's a greater we might call it god we might call it source the force you know something of that nature to kind of get our minds out of just like it's this little thing that's in my head yeah surely mine and your personal consciousness ha have come into being at a certain point when we were born um, and surely our personal consciousness consciousness says we'll cease to be personal at some point, because at some point in the future, we will not be uh, uh, personal agents anymore. So I'm not claiming that uh, our personal consciousness has existed forever. I'm not a solipsist. I'm not saying that, my, that reality is your personal dream. Mm -hmm. um, but our personal consciousness exists in a broader context, in a, in, in a, in a, within a broader mind. And it forms and dissolves in that broader mind. That's the claim. Yeah, well, in, in, the, in the book, you, you go into like, there's our personal consciousness, and there's our personal unconsciousness, or you call obfuscated consciousness, which we'll get into with why you choose to use that term. But then there's also the greater consciousness that we're all a part of. So it's for people to, to I'm just trying to help people make this shift from consciousness just being what's going on inside my head to consciousness being something that's, that's universal, and that matter, as we perceive it rises out of that kind of like when we dream at night that we create these characters in our dream, we create everything in our dream through our own consciousness. Yeah, I, I talk about consciousness as a type of existent. Um, for instance, I know that you are conscious, but I don't have access to your personal consciousness. Yet I grant that it exists. I believe that it exists. Uh, in doing that, I grant that there is consciousness beyond my own personal consciousness. We all do that. There is nothing counterintuitive about it. There is consciousness out there in the minds of other people, other animals, and whatever. The, the claim I'm making is that even things that are non-living, or even the inanimate universe as a whole, it too exists in a form of transpersonal consciousness. So you have to grant that, that there is this transpersonal consciousness out there, but that's not much more difficult than to grant that another person is conscious. Yeah, I, and I think that's, um, you know, it's interesting when we talk about consciousness or life being almost like a dream, which you use a lot of allegories, which you kind of have to, right? Because to get to this stuff, we really can't talk about through direct experience, as you, as you mentioned in the book, we can only talk about the objects that are being experienced as opposed to the experiencer. So when we say that life is like a dream, it doesn't mean like it's like one of our dreams, where it's arbitrary and ephemeral and just kind of, you know, it's all crazy. We, you grant that there are constants in the universe, for example, that are, but they're a part of this overall mind. Is that correct? Yes, I, I grant that there is a world out there um, and we are immersed in that world. We inhabit it and that world would continue to exist whether we are here looking at it or not. I grant that. The only claim is that common shared world is mental in essence. And it presents itself to us in the form of perception, the things we see, hear, taste, which are themselves experiences. Perception is experiential in nature. So the claim is uh, the contents of your perception are the appearance, the image, the representation of something that is really out there beyond us. But that something that is really out there is consciousness. Uh, it, it, the, those are experiential states that present themselves to us as matter in much the same way as your 
experiential states, your conscious inner life presents itself to me as matter, the matter of your body, uh, your brain, its brain activity. Mm -hmm. In my view, that's just the extrinsic appearance, the image of inner uh, experiential states. They just present themselves to me in, on my screen of perception in the form of matter. And then I extend this claim and I say the, universe, the inanimate universe as a whole, too, presents itself to us as the matter that we call the inanimate universe. But mm -hmm. from its own first person perspective, it is experiential in nature. Yeah, and I think... Um... That's, I think these are really important concepts. And, we, and I've, hear, I've heard some of this coming out of science, like we live in a simulation or we live in a projection or something. And, and you talk about, you give a really great analogy, I think of the cylinder projection, right? That if you, look, if you take a cylinder and you look at it from the side and make a projection on the wall, it can look like a square or like a rectangle. But if you look at it from the end, it's a circle. And so when we're trying to describe this ultimate reality that, that lies beyond what we can perceive, we can perceive it in different in different ways, but we're kind of like a like a derivative of it, I guess. Is that a, is that a way of putting it? It is something that is by definition, almost by definition, ineffable because our language has evolved for very practical purposes, you know, mm -hmm. to point at where the food is, to tell where danger lies, which animal can jump on you and kill you. So the language has evolved for very pragmatic reasons. It didn't evolve to talk about uh, what is transcendent uh, mm -hmm. to, to our sense perception. Uh, so from that point of view, you are bound to, to use metaphors. Yeah. And sometimes people think that if two metaphors contradict one another, then uh, one of them has necessarily to be false. Maybe yeah. both, but at least one of them, since they contradict one another. Well, that's not necessarily the case because metaphors are not literal. It's just like the, the shadow projection of a mm -hmm. cylinder. Both are correct. Somebody will see uh, the shadow of a cylinder and would say it's a circle. Somebody else will say it's a rectangle. Oh, they contradict one another, so one is incorrect. No, both are correct because at a higher level, they reconcile. But that higher level is transcendent, so it's very difficult to talk about, uh, which leads to all kinds of confusion. Um, but maybe we don't even need to go to this transcendent space to, to adopt idealism as the most plausible and tenable view because... Mm -hmm. Look, there is no question that mind is capable to generate uh, uh, an entire world on the screen of perception. It happens every night when we dream. Mm -hmm. I have had the privilege a few times in my life to have lucid dreams. And I always, the first thing I do is, oh, I know I'm dreaming now. Can I tell from the resolution, the vividness of what I'm seeing and perceiving around me that it's a dream? And then I pay attention. No, it's crisp resolution the colors are vivid it's very autonomous it seems to have a life of its own and at the same time i know that i'm dreaming because i remember having gone to bed yeah. so because of my continuity in the continuity of my memory i know that I, that, that i'm dreaming but i can't tell it based on my perceptions in the dream alone i know that it is my mind that's generating all this stuff that i perceive around me in the dream uh, I know that it's a part of my mind that I am dissociated from. So it looks like I am inhabiting it and, and I am not it. During the dream, you think you are the dream avatar. But in fact, you are the one mind that is doing the avatar and it's doing everything else in the dream as well. Um, so the, we know that mind can do this. And the only jump you have to make is, can it be doing this right now? Are we avatars of a, dream, of a dreaming mind right now? Mm -hmm. And if so, how can we explain that we are all seemingly having the same dream or at least mutually consistent dreams? Mm -hmm. Because you, you also report seeing cars and trees and stars and whatnot, and that's consistent with my experiences. So there seems to be a collective, le collective level of mind that we are dissociated from during the dream, in other words, during life, which is generating this imagery for all of us. Yet even that is not very difficult to imagine because when you're dreaming and you're lucid in your dream, you know that it is a dissociated part of your mind that is generating the rest of the dream. And yet it feels so external to your dreaming avatar. So it is not counterintuitive idealism. Actually, nature is giving us floods of suggestion, hints yeah. and evidence that this is what's going on, but we are stubborn. We get all tied up in conceptual uh, abstractions and, and we lose touch with what is really right, right there under our noses. 
Yeah, you touched on that. And I, I think that was another brilliant thing I loved about the book. Uh, you talk about how basically the universe, nature is all a metaphor. It's, it's all showing us something that, that can't be really expressed in words. It's all metaphorical. And you mentioned one of my favorite uh, philosophers. Actually, I do know Swedenborg. Uh, one of my favorite theologians, philosophers, whatever you want to call him. And he talks about correspondences. And in the latter part of um, more than that, or in the latter part of material, why materialism is blown, you talk about how, you know, really, if we wake up and look at the world, it's always delivering messages to us, just like the symbols in a dream. Absolutely. There is a famous quote. Well, I'm not sure it's a famous quote, but it is my favorite quote of a, a, an Indian sage called Nisargadatta Maharaj, mm. who lived uh, in the 20th century even. Um, and he said, um, to see the world is to see God. There is no seeing God apart from the world. To know God beyond the world is to be God. So basically what he's saying is that the world around us that we perceive is how a universal mind presents itself to us. It's mm -hmm. the appearance of that universal mind from our perspective from across a dissociative boundary. Um, and that's, that's all you have to know about that universal mind. It presents itself to you in the metaphorical way that we call the physical world. Uh, and to know more about it beyond its representation, its appearance, its extrinsic uh, image, you have to be it. And it is possible to be it, I think, because one day our, the dissociative process that maintains our individuality will end. We call it death. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we merge back into that. And then we get to know it from a first person perspective, as opposed to a third person perspective. So what many traditions are hinting at, not only Nisargadatta, but Swedenborg that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, Schopenhauer, one of my favorite philosophers, uh, just wrote a book about him. He talks about... Um, will and representation so he says the world as it is as it is in itself as a, from a first person perspective is will in other words volitional experiential states that's mm. why that's why the universe is moving going somewhere doing something uh, but that will presents itself to us from a second or third person perspective uh, uh, in, the, in, in the form we call physicality for schopenhauer that's representation the physical is a representation of endogenous inner experiential states, volitional states that mm -hmm. just present themselves to us uh, in the form that we call the material world. Right. From that perspective, matter is a metaphor for whatever is going on from the first person perspective. In just the same way that our patterns of brain activity are a metaphor for how we feel from within. Yeah, you know, uh, I want to get into some of the things. I, I, was, I was listening to your book earlier this week. So I, was, I, was, I, I don't normally read it, but I was listening because I wanted to get through it before our interview. And you talked about, it's, there's just so much stuff it explains that's just not explainable in, in other ways. And you talk about consciousness, and I, which I kind of touched on before, and what people call the subconscious, but you call obfuscated consciousness because nothing is really outside of our consciousness. And it, I just had to stop the re recording and just, I had like a five minute lecture with myself because I was like, I don't want to forget this. So explain what it is, that, that what's the difference between what's in our consciousness and what's that obfuscated part of our consciousness? Yeah. So uh, the word consciousness is used in many different ways, even by philosophers themselves. And there is a reigning confusion about what any one person means by that word at any one instance. Um, to be very uh, um, explicit and unambiguous, when I use the word consciousness, I mean what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. In other words, if there is something it is like to be you, anything, doesn't matter what, then you are conscious. Uh, a conscious state is a state in which there is something it is like to be. Um, if there is nothing it's like to be in a state, then it's non-conscious. Mm -hmm. If there is nothing it's like to be a computer, then the computer is not conscious. If mm -hmm. there is nothing it's like to be a dead person, then a dead person is not conscious, which of course immediately raises the question, is that the case? Um, I don't think it is. But mm -hmm. this is what we mean by phenomenal consciousness. If there is experience, any, it doesn't matter how simple, you don't need to have higher level mental functions, none of that. You don't need to self-reflect, uh, you don't need to be self-aware, no. Mm -hmm. If there is an experience as simple as white and black, 
warm or cold, that's already phenomenal consciousness. And that's what I mean by consciousness. But in even in colloquial use, and also in neuroscience of consciousness, some people use the word to mean something a lot more restricted. Mm -hmm. What they mean by it is what should be called meta-consciousness. Now, consciousness is something you have when you have an experience. Meta-consciousness is something you have when you both have the experience and know that you have the experience. Mm -hmm. So meta-consciousness is conscious metacognition. You not only have an experience, you, you represent that experience to yourself. Um, let, let me try to illustrate it even better. We say, I have pain or I have hunger. We, when we say that, that's an expression of meta-consciousness. If you were not meta-conscious, uh, but only conscious, what you would say is, I am pain, I am hunger, because there is no distinction between the experience and the subject of the experience. Mm -hmm. To say that you have pain, you have to pull yourself out of the experience and contemplate your own experience. Mm -hmm. That's a meta level. That is meta consciousness. Now, what I would say is that um, we need meta consciousness even to report to ourselves that we are conscious. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be able to report that to ourselves. So we would mm -hmm. have experiences, but we wouldn't know that we have experiences. Yeah. Because of that, when we study consciousness or when we introspect into our own consciousness, all we can report is the contents of meta consciousness, the, 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 the stuff that you can self reflect about. Yeah. The stuff that escapes the reach of meta conscious introspection may still be experienced, but you will not be able to report it even to yourself. Let me give examples again. Mm -hmm. Some people have pain without being aware of their pain. You may even ask them, Are you in pain? And they say, No. But then at some point later on, they realize that actually, they were in pain all that time. That's the moment when they become meta-conscious of the mm -hmm. pain. Yeah. Before they were having the pain and they know it uh, in hindsight. Another, another thing that everybody can relate to. Were you conscious of your breathing 10 seconds ago? Were you experiencing the inflation of your, of your, of your uh, uh, chest, uh, the movement of your diaphragm, the flow of air through your nostrils? Mm -hmm. I, I would say you were conscious of it, but you only became meta conscious of it the moment I brought your attention to it. Yeah, right. So my point is what many of us call consciousness is actually only meta consciousness. It's just a tiny little bit of consciousness. But because we call it consciousness and we think that it's the whole, we created words to refer to the rest as subconscious or unconscious. Even psychologists did that. Uh, Carl Jung, Freud, they all talk about the unconscious. Mm -hmm. My point is the unconscious is not unconscious at all. It is conscious. It is just not meta-conscious. Yes. And we don't see it because we can't report it to ourselves and because we are so enamored, so involved with our own meta-consciousness, which is a sort of... It, it, um, we are so involved with ourselves. Yeah. with our own pains, with our own worries, uh, with our own wishes, with our own needs, with the things that we fear and reject. We are so enamored in, in, in this narcissistic loop of meta-consciousness that it obfuscates everything else. If we could just turn down the volume on this meta-consciousness, be a little less busy with what we can introspect into and just become receptive, Boy, you would find out so many things that are going on in consciousness, but we can't report to ourselves. Uh, you, I think most people would be amazed how much is going on there. Yeah, I love the, some of the analogies you gave in the book. You talked about like, in fact, if you're in your car and you're driving and you get home, and you don't realize how you got there. You're obviously conscious while you were driving or you wouldn't have gotten home, but you just weren't aware of it. And, and uh, you talked about the self-reflective thing, which actually amplifies these certain things which kind of makes everything else stamp it out so we can't perceive it. And you gave a great analogy there of the stars during the day. We can't see the stars. And I started thinking about things. I work a lot with people like, who are intuitives, who, people who are mediums, for example. And they've done studies on them when they're actually in a, a trance state, their brain is kind of turned down. 
And I'm wondering if that's what it is. That's what allows that to come through. It's actually available to all of us, but it's just being obfuscated by everything else that's going on in our heads. Yes, I I think, well, uh, there has been neuroimaging studies showing that that's what actually happens with Mm -hmm. trans mediums. Their brain activity decreases uh, significantly. If you pretend to be a medium, uh, your brain activity will increase. Yeah. Um, but uh, people who seem to be authentic trans mediums, their brain activity reduces. I think this has two effects. One is it reduces the obfuscation. If you're not so busy with your own narcissistic you know, thought states, uh, emotional states, it, suddenly uh, m- more stuff begins to come into focus in your peripheral vision. You see that with the corner of your eyes. This is a metaphor, and I'm talking about a mental process. Mm -hmm. But it it is as if uh, um, the obfuscation in the center of your field of view reduced, and suddenly you realize that there's a lot going on in your peripheral vision that suddenly you become uh, uh, receptive to and Mm -hmm. alert to. The other thing that I think is going on, and they may be the same thing, I'm not sure, is that um, I think... um, normal brain activity is what a dissociative process in a universal mind looks like. It is the representation, the appearance of a dissociative process. We Mm -hmm. are dissociated uh, alter personalities of a universal mind. And that dissociation looks like what we call a living being, a body with its ordinary brain activity. I think if you can reduce your brain activity or or at least those parts of patterns of brain function that correspond to to the dissociative process itself, you reduce the dissociation. The dissociative boundary becomes more porous, permeable. And you sort of go beyond your own individual self and you experience things that are out there all the time, but which you couldn't reach because you are dissociated from them. So I think both play a role uh, in this. Yeah, I, uh, well, I wish I had so much more time with you. But, I, you know, the thing is, your book also describes because we hear through a lot of religious traditions that we're all one. And, and you hear people that have NDEs that come back and say, we're all one. And people go, what does that really mean? Through all the metaphors you use in your book in terms of us being consciousness or individual conscious being like a whirlpool in a stream or ripples on a, on a thing of, of mercury or the membrane. We're all, we're all part of this one thing at a substrate level, but we feel differentiated because of our ego and because of the self-reflection that we're doing, it cuts us off from the experience of the other person. Is that, is that a good way of putting it? We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H dot com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. Yes, of course, this is a conceptual narrative. Um, Mm -hmm. For most people, even the ones that buy into this conceptual story, which I think is accurate, I think it's a correct conceptual story as conceptual stories go, um, they still have a very hard time sort of really grokking it, really internalizing this oneness. Because even if I say, as I normally do, um, when you die, your consciousness will go nowhere. It will stay exactly where it is right now. Mm -hmm. But you will not be Brian anymore. It will be something a lot broader. And then people still can't help but think, yeah, but but then that's not really me. Because what I am is is Brian. (laughs) What I am is this body limited in space time. So when we say that your consciousness will survive and you will still be what you are, people don't really feel it. They understand conceptually because of all the metaphors. They even buy into it. They give themselves intellectual intellectual permission to consider this a a serious, plausible hypothesis, but they don't feel it in their bones. Right. Um, And and 
And it's a pity because what I really mean is that it's really you <laughs> who is yeah. going to survive. And in the same way that it's really you that wakes up from the dream. Um, when you wake up from a dream in the morning, you don't mourn the death of your dream avatar, do you? And not at you all. Realize, you realize it was me all along. Yeah. I didn't know it during the dream. During the dream, I thought I was a dream avatar inhabiting a world. Now I woke up. Now I know that I was doing the whole thing, the dream avatar and the world. Mm -hmm. so, so your dream avatar is toast, is dead. He has passed. <laughs> yeah. But is anybody mourning the death of your dream avatar? Of course not, because you realize that it was just a trick, an illusion, a dissociative process in your own mind, so that a part of your mind disidentified with another part of your mind. In other words, the part of your mind playing the dream avatar became alienated, dissociated from the part of your mind generating the rest of the dream. Mm -hmm. You thought, I am the avatar and the world is something else. But guess what? It was you doing both all along. When you wake up, that's plain obvious and there is no problem. And you realize it was really you. You are the one who was the avatar and you are the one who continues to exist after you woke up. If people could just internalize that it's exactly the same thing that I'm trying to say happens when we die. Mm -hmm. Uh, then it would be more than a conceptual story. But it's very difficult to get this point across. Uh, you would have to have a major direct experience of a transpersonal state to realize that, oh, darn, it's really me. Yeah. It's really me what's going on here. It's very, 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 um, how to say, it's, it's so close to your core. It's so intimate. That thing that survives is so close to you, so essential, so, so intimate that you don't see it. It's under your nose. You, 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 you don't see it. You miss it altogether. It's a pity. Yeah, I think um, you do such a great job. And I, it, it helped me because I thought, okay, if my ego goes away, then I go away. I, I am my ego. And you do really, you give some really great thought exercises. Like imagine if you, if you didn't have your name or if you lost a limb, would you still be yourself? And you go, and, and if you've lost your memories, you'd still have that perception of yourself. So what I got out of was when, when, we, when we die, our egoic structure, as you put it in this metaphor, kind of unravels, but the core that's still us is still there. And when that structure unravels, it actually gives us access to what we're being blocked off from now. And that it, it explains to me some of the near-death experiences people have when they say, well, suddenly I was one with everything. Or I, I knew everything there is to know. I hear so many people say, I knew everything there is to know. And that's because all of that information that we're all gathering is all out there. And I, I love what you said, we take it with us, you know, so it's like we lose this when we go. In the same way that you don't lose the memory of the dream when you wake up. Well, sometimes you think you lost it, but actually mm -hmm. it's there because you may remember it days or even years afterwards. Uh, the experiential contents of our individual life, uh, I don't think they stay because where are they going to go? I mean, what's going on is mind, one mind. So where are they going to go? They, 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 they have nowhere to go. Uh, it's just the, the narrative of self that changes. Uh, during your dream, in your dream avatar, you have a narrative of self, an implicit one. You identify with a part of your dream and not with another. Uh, when you wake up, you realize that, oh, it was just you all along. Uh, your narrative of self will change, but your core subjectivity, what Schopenhauer called the one eye of the world that looks out from every creature. That is one and the same everywhere at all times. Uh, it, it goes nowhere uh, because it is that within which everything happens, including birth and death. So where is it going to go? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I, was, I, was, I just actually finished the book up. For, I read it before, but I was reading again, you know, getting ready for the interview and just finished it up this morning. And I just that helped me like so much to understand that, you know, not only am I not going to lose anything when I, when I, when my body dies, but I'll actually gain because all these memories, all these feelings, everything we have, it's still there. We just don't have access to it from the limited perspective we have. And so that, that what we call death actually can open that up. And that's been, like I said, kind of uh, reinforced by people who've had near death experiences. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, the metaphor of a life review, I think that's a metaphor because I think it's much more than a review. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably uh, you're living it again or you're living it in the only way that you have ever lived it. It just mm -hmm. presents itself to you in a different, from a different angle, maybe. Um, 
If we could remember everything we've ever experienced in our lives, we, we would be absolutely and completely overwhelmed by richness. Um, so much so that it would become completely dysfunctional. We would just lie in, in, in an ecstasy of emotions of every kind. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't evolve to experience that. We've evolved to let things go so you remain functional. Um, but I would say that uh, once we are, uh, quote, dead, and these evolved mechanisms are no longer playing a function because they've evolved within the dream, you know, if the dream is over, so, so are the mechanisms. Um, I think we would be overwhelmed by the richness of our, of our lives. Um, and I yeah. think that's what, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's really, well, there are people that can actually remember almost everything and they usually go pretty much insane. Um, people that can, if you give them a time and a date, they can remember exactly what was happening at that time and date. And, and it's, it seems to be more of a curse than, than it is a blessing. So there seems to be something about this coming into the separateness, this, this individualization um, that causes this not only forgetfulness of our own personal past, but forgetfulness of where we came from. I think life is what dissociation in a universal mind looks like. So it's not caused by dissociation. It's not. Uh, it's just what dissociation looks like. And mm. in the same way that flames are what uh, uh, um, uh, combustion looks like, in the same way that uh, lightning is what atmospheric electric discharge looks like. Mm -hmm. um, atmospheric electric discharge doesn't cause lightning. Uh, combustion doesn't cause flames. Flames are what combustion looks like. Lightning is what discharge looks like. Life is what dissociation in universal mind looks like. It's just mm -hmm. the appearance of it. It's the image of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so by definition, if this is correct, uh, by definition, yes, life is intimately tied with a sort of a separation, a, a forgetting, a, a dissociation from uh, the transpersonal contents of consciousness, so to say, experiences that go not only beyond your present moment in life they span your whole life but they span the whole life of every living being that ever existed plus the life of transpersonal states uh, that have never been part of a living being uh, that ought to be very overwhelming and not conducive to the continuance of life i think if you were in that state continuously you wouldn't even try to survive As survival would become such an insignificant pixel uh, in the whole image of universal experience mm, that you wouldn't try point. to survive therefore yeah. life didn't e didn't evolve to to give you access to those states because if it did you would die and you wouldn't pass on your genes right so yeah. um, that's the nature of the game we, we've evolved in order to forget because that preserves um, our ability to to function yeah and, and it's such a success i was reading your book and you know um people talk about the purpose of life, you know, why are we here? And, and, you know, what I kind of got out of it is, you know, the experience, it, it, not only because we think of ourselves as I'm, I'm a person, I'm separate from you. I'm separate from everyone else. But this really this idea that we're all connected that this one, you know, great mind and all having this experiences that contribute to the whole uh, is, is, is a, a, a notion I found in a couple of books. There's a, a woman named Natalie Sudman, who had a near-death experience and her experience, she actually goes and she kind of reports back to this, this team of beings that's really interested in her experience. And I'm reading a, uh, a book right now called The Team that's kind of the same thing. So we're all here. So I, I got the same theme from, from your philosophy that we're all experiencing life from individual points of view, but we're all sharing it at the same time. Um, you, you, you're... Uh, hinting on the notion of a telos, a purpose to this all, right? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm not sure there is a premeditated purpose, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think there is a natural purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and if I look at, based on my own philosophy, if I look at what actually then should be happening is that um, birth is the beginning of, the, of a dissociative process that sort of isolates a part of mind from the rest of mind, much like it happens during your dreams. A part of you gets isolated from the part of mind that conjures up the rest of the dream. Um, but because of evolution, the evolution of life, 
this dissociated segment of mind has evolved some mental abilities that maybe were not present there from the beginning. For instance, metaconsciousness, our ability to metacognize our own experiential states, to, to mm. be self-aware, to identify ourselves as subjects of experience. In other words, we aren't our experiences. We are that which has the experiences. Yeah. Now, that's a major leap. Uh, my cats are their experiences. They're not looking in the mirror and thinking, oh, I'm feeling kind of bored. They know. <laughs> they, are, no, they, they, they are in the flow, instinctual flow of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the original state uh, of the universe. But because living beings, these little dissociated fragments of the universal mind, have had to evolve within a planetary ecosystem and to survive, they have had to develop new cognitive skills, new cognitive abilities, that has led to metaconsciousness. Because for survival, it's extremely useful if you can recognize yourself as a separate agent that has a vested interest in survival. Now you can premeditate, you can plan, you can coordinate activities. Mm -hmm. All those things that, that have made us the dominant species on this planet. So all very nice, but there is something you get along with that. You didn't evolve for it, but you got along with it, which is your ability to think about mind. Hmm. Your ability to not only be mind, but to ponder mentation, to ponder mind, to ask the big questions. Um, I suspect this was the implicit telos, the implicit goal in, in all this game. And um, so we accumulate in metacognitive insights, metaconsciousness insights during life, but we are dissociated, so those insights remain with us. But, you know, when we die, by definition, death is the end of the dissociation. We sort of release that into a broader field. Um, you could think of, um, yeah, no, it's a bad metaphor. I don't want to go there. But um, uh, I don't think any of our insights are ever lost. Uh, they are just released into a broader context uh, when we pass by the nature of the thing. Now, this is interesting. I, I haven't found this in your book, so, uh, I, I, but I want to ask the question. So we, we say at, at death, the death of the body, we, we are, uh, our egoic structure unravels at least somewhat, but we still maintain our individual identity. But you said death, birth is the beginning of, of us. Is, does that, is, so does, do we begin at birth or do we maybe begin before birth? Um, I, I don't think what we really are has ever begun. It is yeah. that within which things begin and end. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, one hypothesis is that uh, there is only a universal mind that dissociates. When it dissociates, life happens. Mm -hmm. And when life ends, it's the end of that particular dissociative process. And then you yes. go back to the universal mind. Mm -hmm. So there are only two levels. Either we are individual living beings or we are oceanic mind. Mm -hmm. It is conceivable that there are levels in between, that there is a hierarchy of dissociation. So when you die, you don't become the oceanic mind in one go again. You fall back into a broader level, but also still individual, differentiated or individuated at some level. Maybe not a, a single person, but still differentiated from the rest. It is possible. I don't know whether we have strong enough empirical reasons to think that that is the case. I know very serious people who are convinced that there are enough empirical reasons to, to categorically state that this is the case, that you don't cease to exist as an individual agent, even though you're no longer an individual person. Um, I'm open-minded about that. I think the jury is still out. But if you ask me, do I find it important? Not at all. I don't think it's any more important than whether you should mourn the death of your dream avatar when you wake up. Because if it is the case that, a, that, that there is a hierarchy of, dis of dissociation, then there is a hierarchy to the dream. There is a hierarchy to the illusion. But what is really, really, really going on is there is only one subject experiencing, experiencing itself through multiple points of view. And it, it is this distinct point of view that, uh, that um, arise from dissociation that leads to the illusion of individual agency, separateness, uh, differentiation. Um, but it is ultimately uh, an illusion. So 
for me, it's not very important. Although I know that for many, many people, it is important mm -hmm. to, to, to think that some form of indiv individuation of differentiation persists. And it's very all possible that that's the case. Yeah, I think there's, um, I, I'm not a philosopher, of course, but I think there's evidence for, you know, from, from mediumship, for example, when they tell us they're communicating with an individual consciousness on the other side and the consciousness is still the same as they were when they were here. Uh, from their death experiences, even when people say I merged into the one, they're like, but it was still I. You, you yeah, still but the had one is you, right? So, <laughs> but the people... one is the I, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but they still have that that individual perspective, I guess. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting. I had a friend; she had a near death experience, and, and we were we were talking about uh, reincarnation. And she said, "I'm not sure if there's reincarnation or not." She said, "I saw all these other people," but she said. I was so close to them, like sharing thoughts and everything, that I couldn't tell whether they were me or, or I was them. There you go. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, what can I add to this? I would just plant another thought in your mind, if mm -hmm. I may. I'll try at least. Yeah. Um, along with uh, uh, Immanuel Kant and Arthur Schopenhauer, I also think that space and time are... Yeah, are cognitive scaffoldings. They, they don't exist out there. Mm -hmm. They are categories of perception. Uh, they are um, modes by which we know things, we learn things, and we can um, organize our knowledge. We need extension. We need a scaffolding on which we can hang pieces of knowledge mm -hmm. so we can organize them in a way that makes sense. So I think space and time are not objectively out there. I think what's out there is mind outside space-time. Mm -hmm. um, and space-time is something we create as part of the dissociation in order to try and make sense of what's going on. It's, it's, it's our own category of perception built by nature, but it is illusory. If that is true and out there there is no space and time, then there is no sense in talking about what happened before somebody's birth of or where the person is after the person has died, yeah. because this is all time dependent. Uh, the, the, this is all time language, spatial yeah. temporal language. Uh, and if it's true that this is just in our cognition and out there there is no such a thing, then there is no sense in talking about the end or the beginning of anything. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And uh, I think the dream analogy kind of helps with that because we realize this world that create in our, in our dreams. We would never say there's space or time in our, in our dreams, but we perceive it. Or when we're playing a computer game, you know, our character, the pixels are running across the screen. There's no space or time in a computer game, but the, the character can move in space and time. So those analogies help me because that's a really difficult thing when people say to me, you know, space and time were just an illusion because I experience it every day. Our, our way of thinking, our language is uh, all assume space and time. It is impossible to talk coherently without implicitly assuming space and time. It's built into language. When yeah. we talk about the separation between subject and object, that's space built into it. When we conjugate a verb in different tenses, past, present, and future, I was there, I am here, I will be somewhere else. It's built into language, space and time. So it is hopeless to try to reason outside space and time. All we can do is to abstract the possibility um, that uh, it, it's not really out there, that there is no space and time out there. It's like a, it's like a record. Um, when you play a record, it plays in time, but the information is all there yeah. at any one point. Yeah. So uh, here we are playing the record because it helps our cognition. But uh, the idea of um, there not being space and time is like the record. Everything is out there uh, in the now, and there is only the now. It's like yeah. the record. All songs are in the record at all times. Actually, arguably, this is even one of the implications of Einstein's um, uh, theory of relativity, the blocked universe hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, because time becomes relative to an observer, you, you're sort of forced into the idea that... Uh, everything that has ever been is or will ever be in fact is it exists as the block universe mm -hmm. and time is just how you traverse that block it's how you slice that loaf of bread uh, that's time but the loaf is there at all times the block universe i mean at all times here i'm talking about time again yeah you can't, you can't get away from there it. Yeah. yeah the loaf exists 
period. Anything else I say about it is about how we traverse the loaf. It already, already has the space and time scaffolding built into it. So it's very difficult to talk about it in explicit, literal and accurate ways. But um, the whole idea of the end of personal identity is associated with this limitation of our cognition. We have to think in terms of space and time. Mm -hmm. So we have to think in terms of beginning and end. Uh, all I want to suggest is that uh, this may not really reflect what's going on. Whoever was, is, or will ever be, is, is yeah. period. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great way of looking at it and putting it. Um, I want to touch on one more point that, that you brought up in the book that that was really interesting uh, about free will. Um, and I just watched a, a series uh, on TV called Devs. It was on Hulu. It was really, really interesting because these, these guys are like, the universe is deterministic, period. There is no such thing as free will. You just, you start it. It's a chain of cause and effect. And, and that's it. If we had a big enough, more powerful enough computer, we could predict, you know, everything we could project in the forward and in the, in the, in the future and in the past. And you brought up free will. And you, it's just how you talked about it. First of all, we can't never really experience it, which I never thought about. I never know whether I'm making a choice until I've made it. But also that free will is maybe outside of our material universe. This is a nuanced uh, subject. When we, when we talk about free will, let's analyze our intuition. We don't mean by free will that our choices are random, right? Our choices are not random. They are determined by our tastes, preferences, predispositions, predilections, you know, uh, things that we are. So our choices are not random. They are free, but by being free, we don't mean that they are random. But they aren't determined either, right? Because otherwise there wouldn't be free will. Right. So the problem is there is nothing in between randomness and determination. There is no semantic space in between these two right. concepts. So what we mean by free will are determined choices, but choices that are determined by that with which we identify. In other words, choices determined by us, by that which we consider ourselves to be. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't identify with patterns of brain activity inside our skull, because that's an abstraction. We don't identify with that. So if somebody tells you that your choices are determined by patterns of brain activity in your skull, it violates your sense of free will, because that's not how you see yourself. Mm -hmm. What you think of as yourself are your felt predispositions, your felt preferences and tastes, your felt preferences and tastes, not neurons firing inside your head. I don't think there is a contradiction here because neurons firing without, within your head are just what your felt preferences look like from a perspective. They are the image of the process, not the cause of the process. So I think if there is only one universal mind, by definition, there is free will in the sense that everything that's chosen by the universal mind is chosen by itself. There is nothing beyond it. You see, I, I'm not free, free to choose if uh, there are outside forces that impose a choice on me. Right. Um, if I cannot choose my favorite job because there are economic pressures for me to pick that one instead of anything else, then I'm not free to make the choice because there are external forces that impinge on me and force my hand on making the choice. But at the level of the universal mind, there are no external forces. There is only it. It's the one thing that's going on. So even to talk about free will loses its meaning because whatever choices the universal mind makes, they are determined. They are determined by the universal mind, by the inherent preferences and predispositions of the universal mind, which arise from the fact that the universal mind is what it is. Yeah. It's just what it is. It can't yeah. help being something else. It is what it is. Um, so it chooses according to what it is, according to how it feels, to what it prefers, and so forth. So, yes, it's free, but at the same time, it's fully determined. It's determined by what it is. Um, so the whole talk about free will, I think, sort of dissipates into a sem semantic void at that level. Now, now, the question is, does free will exist at our individual level? Mm -hmm. That is tricky, um, I also don't think that's very important. And I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. 
Um, does your dream avatar have free will? No, it doesn't seem it's like it. It's your will, right? Yeah it's, yeah, it's my will. Yeah, it does. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So your dream avatar was an illusion. How can an illusion have free will? Right. It's not what's going on. It's an right. artifact of thought. Right. So I think that's exactly what's going on right now. So I don't think we have free will, but hmm. we don't exist to begin with. Yeah. We are a cognitive hallucination. At the same time, I could say in full confidence, yes, we have free will. What we really, really are, which is not Bernardo and Brian and somebody else, what we really, really are mm. has free will. Mm -hmm. What we think we are doesn't. It yeah. can't. It's an illusion. Yeah. That's, that's, it's not that, even there to begin with. How can it have anything? It's not there. Yeah, that's a really great point. So I, 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 one last thing I want to, I want to touch on is uh, your book, More Than Allegory. Because for me, you know, it, I, it was really interesting how you basically said we have to have allegory. Because there are some things we just can't talk about with, with our language limits, with the limits of our mind. And for, you really redeemed for me a lot of these things that we say are just allegory. It's just, you know, it's just a, it's just a fictional story. And I got to give you the, the last part of, of more than allegory. You could be a fiction writer. It was really, you, <laughs> you, you created this, this, this new uh, allegory, this new, as you called it, a religious allegory that people wouldn't even recognize as religious. So if you could just finish by talking about that, I'd appreciate it. About the, the third part of that book. About or the third about, part uh, of the book and about the whole idea of allegory. Okay, uh, we are so used to this unexamined assumption that uh, language can point to the ultimate reality, literally. Um, and we never stop to think that there is no reason to believe that the cognitive uh, apparatus of uh, a primate evolved on a very peripheral planet, on a peripheral solar system, uh, probably didn't evolve enough to pin down the literal facts of reality. I mean, we are deluding our, ourselves. It's like a, if a mouse would look up to you and say, I think I can solve the grand unification theory <laughs> problems. I mean, you would laugh at that mouse. The mouse just doesn't have what it takes to figure that out. I think mm -hmm. we are the mouse in another frame, uh, um, in another, in another um, from another perspective, we mm -hmm. are the mice, you know? yes. mm -hmm. and we think that we can point at the literal facts of reality. Of course we can't. Uh, language didn't even evolve for this. Um, I think allegories, myths are very important because they admit that uh, they are not pointing at anything literal. They are not telling you, look, this really happened as I'm saying. If you interpret an allegory or a myth like this, you're flattening it. You're making it a pancake instead of the rich three-dimensional thing that it's meant to be. Uh, what they do is they point your mind in a certain direction such that you can pick, what is, pick up what is really going on with your peripheral vision, if you know what I mean. Yes, absolutely. So, so they guide you to look here, but what they want to show you is not that mm -hmm. it's what you can pick up with your peripheral vision if you're looking more or less in that direction and i think that's what myths do they they help us pick up the real nature of reality what is really going on with our peripheral vision mm -hmm. but for that it's important that we keep in mind that uh, we shouldn't take it literally because to take it literally is to kill it yes um we should keep alert for what's going on in our peripheral vision when we indulge ourselves in a myth, which I think is something that we would benefit from doing a lot more than we do today. We've lost respect for myths. Uh, we've, we've associated myths with fiction. Mm -hmm. That's not what they are. It's not fiction. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a metaphor. It's a symbol. It is pointing at something that is true and mm -hmm. not fiction, but it's doing so indirectly through a what uh, Peter Kingsley would call, um, what's the, the word he used? Uh, a form of incantation. Mm, okay. It's an incantation. Um, and, and that's the value they have. If, if we receive them, take them on board as that incantation that uh, makes, makes something appear within us as opposed to pointing our eyes to something that exists out there. They, they turn your eye somewhere, but by doing that, something appears within you that was not in the words of the myth. 
Um, yeah. It evokes that within you. Um, and we've lost that ability in our society, which is a phenomenal pity. <laughs> well, I think um, all, most of the problems of our world and all the problems of our world can be pinned to the fact that we don't know who we are, that we have this materialist mindset that we think we're meaningless cosmological accidents, we're random, random uh, configurations of atoms and molecules. And we, we were born and we're going to die. So I really, really appreciate the work that you're doing. Uh, and I appreciate it from a philosophical combined with a scientific perspective. It doesn't require me to have any faith in anything. I can just look at this and, and you can reason yourself through it. I can only read a little bit at a time because it's so, it's so deep. I have to like, I have to sit and reflect on it for a while to just really understand what I've just read. Um, are there any, is there anybody else that's doing what you're doing that, that's preaching the message of real of, of idealism? Oh, certainly. Okay. Certainly. I'm trying to bring them together <laughs> now okay. so it becomes more visible. Uh, but, you know, this message is, not, is nothing new. It has been around for at least, what, 3,500 years sure. since the, the original scriptures behind the Vedas uh, were uh, uh, passed on uh, yeah. for the first time. Uh, this is an intuition that has been in, in the human species mm -hmm. since the, the dawn on our, of our species. Uh, when we were connected to, to the ground of reality, we knew it. We were not metacognitive of it. We didn't right. know that we knew it, but we knew it. And now we got lost in a conceptual story. So now it, it has become a, a discovery. <laughs> Nothing is being discovered here. Uh, it's yeah. just the, 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 the raw uh, primordial reality uh, to which we have always been connected by our umbilical cords. It's the ground from which we arise. So deep within, at the core of our being, we all know and have always uh, known it. But there are other people making it explicit. Some yeah. of them are quantum physicists, and they use the language of quantum physics. Some of them are analytic philosophers, and they use the language of analytic philosophy, you know, reason, logic. Mm -hmm. Others are philosophers in the continental tradition. And they use completely different language to talk about the same things. And you can look at the phenomenologists, at the constructivists, it's very different language. They're saying the same thing. Uh, and then there are the spiritual guys, the, the neo Advaita, the non duality guys. Mm -hmm. They're saying the same thing. Rupert Spira, uh, uh, Abhi Ashanti, these guys are all saying the same thing with different metaphors, different language, different. Um, references, uh, they substantiate it differently. So it, it looks like a cacophony of different messages. Mm -hmm. But if we can really go past the appearances and really grasp the underlying meaning, man, everybody's saying the same thing. It, uh, it, it, it's all over the place, if we have the eyes to see. Yeah, just, just in the last couple of weeks, I was just fumbling around the internet and I came across something from the Khan Academy. And this guy was explaining Hinduism. And when he starts talking about Brahman and Atman and, and Maya, it was like, this is the same thing Bernardo is saying. Yeah. It's, it's the exact same thing. And it's Hinduism, which is what, 5,000 years old? I don't even know. Yeah. But yeah, but you have, to, you have to have the eyes to, to go where the myth wants to take you. Because if right. you interpret it literally, you just say, oh, Hinduism is a polytheist religion, many gods. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> It is not. And they are quite clear about it. There is only Brahman. There is only one thing going on. Mm -hmm. And everything else is generated for Brahman, within Brahman, in a, in a fantastic strike of cognitive hallucination. That, that, that's basically what it's saying mm -hmm. uh, in mythological form, in the language of the people uh, uh, of the time, the time when it was written. Today, we can't read it in that way. Because you see, those myths were written for people who could only understand things symbolically. Mm -hmm. The idea of a literal truth didn't exist. That's not how the human mind worked originally. Right. We sort of invented it the past few centuries. Yes. This idea of something literal is, is fresh, it's rather new. Uh, we, we naturally think by analogy. Mm -hmm. In other words, we think symbolically. Yes. Um, and these texts were written to be read that way because when they were written, there was no other way <laughs> to read yeah, them. Yeah. That was the only thing, the only game in town. Now we created this distinction, metaphorical and literal, and it got lost in that. And we think that those were just myths or just, just fictions. They weren't. 
Yeah, and that's a big mistake we make even with the Bible, which compared to those things is relatively modern. But people read the Bible as literal, and if you can step back and take a metaphorical view of the Bible, it's so rich. There's oh, so yeah. much, and you, and you talked about God coming into His own creation through Jesus, and how that lines yes. up with all the other religious uh, allegories or myths. And and things like the Book of Job, that's rich. The Book of Job, I mean, that's subject for a lifetime of meditation. Yeah. If you can read it in the way it was meant uh, to be read, which is not as God literally torturing poor Job right. for no reason, <laughs> right. uh, just because the devil ch- dared God to do it. No, no, no. There is something much deeper going on there that speaks to what we are. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you uh, very much for doing this. As I said, it's, it's been a thrill for me to sit down and have a conversation with you. Um, I, I've learned, I learned so much from your books and your lectures. I encourage people um, to, to go to your website. It's, uh, could you give your website again, please? Uh, one word, Bernardo Castrop with a K, castrop.com. Uh, and from there, you can go everywhere else. So social media, videos, papers, essays, books, everything. Yeah, you're, you're doing fantastic work. So I, I, I appreciate everything you're doing. And, and thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's been All a right. pleasure. You have a good evening. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. That's it for another episode of Grief to Growth. I sure hope you got something out of it. Please stay in contact with me by reaching out at www.grieftogrowth.com. That's grief, the number two, growth.com. Or you can text the word growth to 31996. That's simply text growth, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. Since you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure you're subscribed. So hit the subscribe button and then hit the little bell here and it'll notify you when I have new content. Always please share the information if you enjoy it. That helps me to get more views and to get the message out to more people. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day.